Remember Paul of, of Tarsus when he was changed? And it says that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 of all the things he went through. And then in chapter 12, he lets us in on a little mystery. He says, because of the multitude of revelations that was given to me for your sake, a messenger of Satan was assigned to me to deal me blows and keep me humble. Now, I said it the way it's really translated in the Greek. Okay? The messenger of Satan is just that, a satanic spirit to follow people who are really moving in the kingdom of God to try to get them to stop. So Satan's assigned a special messenger to harass Paul all his life. And you can read all about his persecutions and everything. So what makes us think that Satan isn't going to, when we get on fire, we're going to get excited and things come together, that he isn't going to try to discourage us one way or the other. Look at your neighbor and say, Amen. Amen. I'm going to stand. Yeah. So we know because we study scripture together, we know that our God has made an absolute provision for us. We are in a fallen planet. We are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. That's what that is. We will fear no evil because you are in us. See, the Old Testament says you are with me. But see, we're in what Testament? Yeah, we, we read from the Old Testament, but we're in the New. And because you're not just with me, God, you're in me. You see the difference? And what Satan is trying to keep everybody in the church from understanding is their new covenant rights in God. And we're going to be launching out and training you and helping you to reveal certain mysteries in prayer. Some of which you know, some of which maybe you don't know. And if anything else, how to apply those truths so you get the results that you need. Someone say amen. amen. All right. Let me give you another Old Testament, New Testament illustration. Remember the leper that came to Jesus? He said to Jesus, now I'm just going to keep his own. Lord, if it be your will, you could clean me. You see, the Old Testament kept God in the shadows. They didn't know a loving God in their heart because Jesus hadn't died and rose again. Jesus was the example. You've seen me, you've seen the, the Father, Philip. If you watch what I do, you're watching the Father. Okay? Because he's not the Father. But he's doing everything the Father said to do, fulfilling all demands for our salvation. Can you say amen? And so the leper came to Jesus and says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Old Testament is always relying on whether God wants to or not. Old Testament. If you hang in the Old Testament, you're always going to be wondering if God's going to do it or not. I mean, that's legitimate. That's not wrong. But see, in the New Testament, we have God on where? in us and Jesus is the same yesterday today and so what was Jesus answer to the leper he says I will you see in the New Testament God's love towards you is I will I will you have my son I will love you I will watch over you. You just come to me. Be with me. You pal up with me. I know him as a father. I know him as my friend. Don't you know him as your friend? He's so good. And that's what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be launching out on the mysteries of prayer. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to let you know about your covenant. All right. We're going to start out with this basic text. Would you go with me to Hebrews chapter 8? Let's look at our scripture now. All right. For in him, let's all read it together. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. How many of you are in him? So you have access of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
wow. You see, we usually just read over this and we go, isn't that nice? No. And you are what? See, the devil's trying to take your completeness from you. See, we always got it wrong. We're not trying to get our victories. We have our victory. What we do is put up the shield of faith and let God work out our own salvation with us. And we do it with fear and trembling, thinking that we can make a big boo-boo. So let's be quiet and listen to our, our Father guide us through life until we have learned the ropes. Jesus says, hook up with me, learn my ropes. Learn the way I do things. You'll find rest to your soul. Amen. Learn the way I do things. Don't learn the way you think it should be done. Because there's a million opinions. All right. It says, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality. The principality and power here is the devil. Principality is the Greek word ark. Where we get archangel or archon. There are the Lucifer's bunch. The principalities are Satan's fallen Lucifer angels. Okay? You just need to know that. Okay? So, Jesus is above Luciferian's fallen kingdom. Can you say amen? And you're complete in him who's the head of all principalities, fallen angels, and powers, those who listen to him. You see, it wouldn't do this country any good for the person in charge listening to the wrong spirit. We'd all suffer, right? So we need to pray that they don't listen to the principalities and powers. They have but a short time. We have forever. Look at your neighbor and say, we have forever. We have forever, Michael. And don't you leave today without me laying hands on you again. You're the only one named Michael here. <laughs> and you can hear me very well. Let's go on. All right. Having wiped out. This is after Jesus rose again from the dead. Having wiped out. What's wipe out mean? You ever been on a blackboard and it's been wiped out? Wiped out the handwriting and requirements that was against us which was contrary to us, Satan's accusations, and we in Adam's sin, he has taken out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You're debt free. Everyone say, I'm debt free. And when you make a mistake, you're God's business, not everybody else's. Don't go out and purposely try to make them. But we're going to make mistakes. Remember, your own father's not going to throw you away. He wants you to come right to him and, him and talk with him so he can help you. Don't stay away. Don't get in the car and drive away. Don't get mad. And go hide yourself in your room. No, go see God and have him rip that stuff out of you. God plucks out. He pulls out. He plants and he restores all in our soul when we meet with him. Say amen, somebody. And he says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumph them. You see, back in the olden days, when a king ruled over a country and, 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 and ruled over the, and won a war over that country, they took the leaders and the generals and they chained them up behind the chariots and they led them through the city, making a mockery out of them. That's what Jesus did to the devil. He's right now, and you wouldn't be able to, to focus because our focuses need to be on the Lord. He's right now parading the devil all through the world as a defeated foe. But Christians are going, oh, what do we do about this? What do we do? You're not going to do anything. You're going to pray like you're supposed to. <laughs> Your job is not to correct the body of Christ. Your job is to pray for one another. There are a bunch of wonderful Christians totally asleep. They have no clue what I'm sharing with you. And they've got cancer and they're sick and they're all this kind of stuff. Tell them the good news, will you? There's not enough of me to go around. That's why we do the broadcast. So this will get out. Take these broadcasts and send them to everybody on your YouTube and all the whole works. If they hate it, great. And if they love it, great. Do something. Don't sit around and get all this cake yourself. Amen. All right, so go with me to Hebrews. 
We're going to look at verse 8. All of our prayer, everything that we base our faith on is based on the covenant of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Now, what is a covenant? You guys, you go to Hebrews, okay? A covenant is the highest contract that could ever be made. In the Old Testament, God needed somebody in the earth to call for him to come so he could make a contract with him. We have a good example of that in Abraham. Abraham was in Ur of the Chaldees. He was in Samaria. Okay? They worshipped everything but God. And finally he got tired. He says, if there is a real God, show me. That's all he said. And it says that God showed up and says, I am God. Here I am. Oh, remember, God needed the invitation to come. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus came because of those invitations, fulfilled everything, paid for everything, died, rose again, and says, now, anybody comes to me, I will in no wise cast you out. I will reject you. I will teach and train you if you will listen to me. Come to me daily. I will teach you and train you how to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that's what we're learning, isn't it? All right, got Hebrews chapter 8? Look at verse 8. No, verse 6, sorry. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. Let's talk about Jesus. Now, since he rose from the dead, he's obtained a more excellent ministry. Insomuch he is also a mediator of a better what? All right. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. And as God, he represents God to man. But as a man, he's a man too. He represents man to God. So he's a mediator. Can you say amen? So when the enemy accuses you, Jesus steps in and says, no, they're forgiven. And you don't need to even pay any mind to that. And when you make a mistake, and even if you did it out of honoriness or you just gave in, God is not going to throw you away. You're going to feel plenty of guilt. Everyone say guilt. It's not from God. It's from the devil and from my flesh. Okay, so, and possibly from some other people that don't know any better. <laughs> Forgive us. But, but the whole thing is, you know the difference between conviction and condemnation. Let me share it briefly. Conviction is when God tells you in your heart you need to change. He puts no guilt on it. There isn't any feeling unworthy or any feeling condemnation. There's some feeling like when he told you that, oh, that's what it is. And remember, he's always there to help you get rid of it. He's never there going to leave you alone and say, you got to deal with it, son. <laughs> no, he's right there working in us, right? So what we do, though, is we get under condemnation. For example, I might say, hey, you really need to really work on that. If, the, if you're listening to the flesh, you'll feel like I'm condemning you. But if you listen to the Spirit, you'll hear in your heart, that's right, I'm working with you, son. That's your pastor. He really loves you. He wouldn't say that to you if he, if he hated you, you see. But we don't get that sensitive to God. We sort of interpret everything we hear and everything. Wrong. Get with God and let him put his eyeglasses on you. Let him put his ears on you. That's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the armor of God. And what it is, how it operates. Each little piece as best as we can with our time, okay? Say amen. amen. So look, let's read on. This covenant is based and established on better promises. Listen, verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless then no place would have been sought for the second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Everyone say Jews. And the house of Jacob. Say house of Jacob. And say Gentiles. Now you know Jews, Israel, and when they split off, they went the way of the Gentiles, Judea, Gentiles. A new covenant between the Jews and the Gentiles. Come on, get with it. All right, let's go. We barely even begin to scrape the surface. All right, so everything that we do, Marvin, is based on the covenant. Everything we do and we say. 
So when we start gossiping and talking negative, is that based on the covenant? No. So we'll get to that a little later on. All right. So remember the two houses parable that I gave you? Remember that? I love God so much. He gives me all, he, he cracked a joke on me the other day. <laughs> you know, God cracks a joke. And for those of you who love to pick on me, he, he cracked a joke with me about me. It's, it's cool. Amen. So anyway, so let's, let's, let's look at this thing for a minute. With all of the things that God shares with us, for us knowing what we are, uh, let's talk about our two houses, okay? Are you an old man and a new man? Yes. Don't say no, because you bathe your old man every day. You put deodorant on, you spray down the hair, whatever we do, because you're pretty. But you see, we can't live from the old man unto God because it's not capable for our flesh and this fallen thing to follow after God successfully. So we're to crucify it because of the nature of Satan and the nature of sin are in our flesh. That's what causes us to age and causes us to get sick and fear and all the other things. All comes from the flesh, not from the spirit nor from the soul if you're born again. Can you say amen? But what happens a lot of the times is we don't go and meet with God and so our flesh comes along with us and we're trying to follow God and then we hear in our mind, yeah, but, and, you know, that's not going to work. And you start to hear all this stuff. No, you go to God, have him deal with that. Say amen. All right, so the two houses, they're actually a, just a type and shadow. Your old house is the old you. Your new house is the new you. Your old house is the Old Testament. And the new house is the New Testament. How many here can imagine somebody who has two houses? One that was built in the 1900s, has no new amenities, but it's functional. Even comes with an outhouse. A little bit of running water. Right? And then somebody builds you a brand new house. You didn't even build it yourself. It not only comes with all the amenities, dishwasher, all the kinds of fancy things in the bathroom, in the kitchen. It even comes with servants. Yes, this house comes with servants. They're called angels. <laughs> all right. But here's what happens because of the deceiver. We're living in our old house. Yet there's a brand new house waiting for us. But I am unworthy to live in the new house. And you know, I got kind of used to some of these older things. I don't know if I, I could really enjoy such a new house. And that's what we're doing to God when we don't live in the New Testament. When we start offering him feasts and flagging and doing all that stuff, which is wonderful. Most of those people don't have a clue what they're doing. But they think God loves it, so they're doing it. They're living in the old house trying to please God. Move your little bottom out of that old covenant into the new covenant and find out how to live for God from the inside, the new man, and not the old crabby dude. Old house, the old you. New house, the new you. Old house, the Old Testament. New house, the New Testament. Think about it. You cannot live the old way of your life in the New Testament. And you cannot live in the flesh and expect to please God. Romans 8, it says, I think it's verse 13, it says, No man in the flesh can please God. Just says it right there. So what, what should we do? What, what should we do, Pastor Gay? Get out of the flesh. Amen. Right. So how do I do that? Meet with God. Have him yank that junk off you. Stop wearing around your old guy, your old woman. Excuse me. Your old lady. No matter how I say the lady part, it always sounds bad. Bring around the old, we'll just use old man, you know. And we'll say, hi, God, I brought my old man just to say Hi. And God's going, 
that's got the devil in it. Now, I'm going to say something to you that might make you a little mad, but you need to study. Your flesh has a nature, and it's just your flesh, not your soul, not your mind, and your, and your spirit. But your flesh has the nature of Satan in it. That's why people can become like Hitler or like a serial killer. The spirit, the evil spirit works with that evilness in their flesh. Satan's nature gangs up and they don't have a conscience anymore. There's no conscience to tell them, tell them no or go or anything like that. They're just completely taken over and demonized. That's how that happens. But the Bible says, come unto me, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So Listen. I got, I got some people that I'm dealing with. They're full-fledged into the new age and satanic stuff. And they're always doing the solstices and all this kind of stuff. And they're jumping around. Next thing you know, they'll be cutting themselves, you know. Kind of like Baal and all the different priests. And every time there comes a solstice, this person disappears and does the hoobie-jubies. Well, we got news for them. We sent them a message. What's the message? We're not having abortion anymore. And we're going to continue to send those satanic people, those Luciferians, the same message. Jesus Christ is coming. You better run in terror. And he's coming in people that are not going to compromise. That's you. People that are sold out for God. We're going to live. We're going to get people saved. We're going to get past ourselves and get people saved and get out of here. God is waiting for the last souls to be saved. Who's reaching out to win them? Amen. Say, I am. There you go. That's your chance to really get it. Okay, we're going to cover these areas. Good heavens. This has just been an introduction. Today, we hopefully will get through these areas. Take a note. We're going to get, show you how to get dressed with God. Okay? We're going to show you why it works, how it works, and why you need to be dressed by God and not yourself. Two, putting on... Being dressed by God and which each part does. The helmet, the breastplate, which part is and what it does. What each piece, how it works with our spirit. It works with our spirit and not our flesh. And then finally, the last part. This is just the first one of a foundational thing. You notice that I've been teaching on prayer, meeting with God for how long now? And the reason why I've taken the time to do that is because you'll always retreat now to God when you have a problem and not to the pastor, not to your friends, not get on the old council line. No, you'll learn, you've learned to meet with God on everything you do and you'll find that two-thirds of your battles are won right there. Once you do that, all the other stuff is just clean up. I said, all the other stuff is just clean up. Amen. So what we have to do is say, God, rearrange what I'm doing. Make sure that I'm not out there somewhere I don't need to be. And I'm beating the air and wasting my time. I need to be listening and watching over you. Now, remember, this is not a legalism. We're talking about a warfare prayer. Now, I'm teaching on this because this prayer is just not any prayer. This is in intercession and warfare. The kind of stuff that removes abortions, uproots leaders, changes countries. When you start dealing with that kind of weight, I need to train you. Because once you want to lodge these spirits, they're going to come for you. You see, once I kick the devil's teeth in, you think I could take a, a sabbatical from God? Do you think he's going to forget what I did? No. So guess what? It's a fearful thing to be in the hands of God, but now you know that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And the namby-pamby junk Satan's doing is because of the weak-willed, unthinking human beings that let him do it. Don't get mad at me. It's the truth. Now, I'm, I'm a little more forceful today because this is war. We're not fighting for our own souls. We're fighting for the souls of our family, for the souls of this country, for the souls of hurting people. I weep at night for people whose hearts are crying. Lord, I need help. I want them to hear that I'm praying for them and that I'm reaching out. See, God is unlimited and I'm very limited, but I go to an unlimited God and I, re 
I, what is the word? I invite his resources in on my behalf to begin to use those tools. Amen. But I don't use my own resources, my own mental ability to remember. I go to the word and get those resources from the word. So we're going to give you some today. And lastly, once Christ is put on, we are to walk through life. We have to watch two areas, our mouth and our actions. Because once you've got the armor on, it'll stay on you all day until you open your mouth and start speaking negative stuff. Does, then it doesn't fall off. It dims. And the more negative, worldly you start talking, side of one side and next side, it dims. The sad thing about it dimming is you appear. You see, when you go to God, he covers you. When you get up from God and you walk on, if you guard your mouth and what you do, you are looking like Jesus, sweetheart. You are looking like Jesus, mighty man of God. Until we start talking and getting involved in things, then the armor starts dimming. And who starts appearing? Our mouth. <laughs> Our actions. So it's really not hard. If you want to stay hidden in God, ask God to help you with what you say and what you do, what you entertain in your mind. Say amen, not say oh me. All right, so let's go to one. Getting dressed in Christ. Go with me to Romans 12 real quickly. I want to get through these preliminaries till we can get to the different kinds of prayer. Once we reach down through Ephesians chapter 6, it says praying always with all kinds of prayer. Okay? While you're going there. And what it means is there are many different styles of prayer in praying that a lot of us cover. We don't know what they are. I like to define them by definition so we understand what's going on. For example, like the prayer of agreement. You don't see much prayer of agreement nowadays because most people don't agree on anything or very Solomon stuff. And that's completely wrong. Because we, we got one thing we can agree on, Jesus. And let's get out of here. Let's walk in love. Can you say amen? There's a lot we can agree on. Why pick on people's disagreements? Sounds like a deception to me. All right, so we go in and we get dressed. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, you, your spirit man, present your body, your bod suit, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Old English word, which is what is expected of you. If you're going to have any service with God, you got to get your flesh out of the way. So you need to present your body a living sacrifice. This is what is expected by God from you. If you don't present your body before the Lord, you're going to carry around that Complainer everywhere you go. Come on, you know your flesh complains. Too hot, too cold, too this, too that. Maybe too much. Come on, you know I love you very much. Okay. It's serious. When you start praying like this, you get answers like the one we just got two days ago. Abortion, no more going to be a federal thing. Now, we got to pray it out of the, the, the states and everything. Now, what's the problem with a lot of Christians, generally speaking, and not picking on any one person, is we do too much shotgun praying. Ba-boom! Ba-boom! And whoever it hits, wipes them out, you know. No, you need to be a sharpshooter. You can dig a cancer out of somebody in Africa if you know how to pray right. Because it's God's power that does that. But it's your words that give him permission to do it. It's your words that give God permission so he can come in legally and do it. Now, if the person never asks for healing, then healing will stop right up to them until they say, I really want to be healed. And God says, right on. Pew. The human will is what resists a lot of God. Are you willing to let God do whatever he wants in your life? 
Let me see an amen. All right. So, I beseech you, says, be not conformed, but lay your body out as a living sacrifice. And what happens? Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. It tries to put you into a mold. But be transformed by the what? Court, you know the thing, that you may prove what is good, acceptable, perfect, will of good. 30, 60, 100 fold. Okay? Once we start renewing our mind, God begins to show you how he sees things. And pretty soon, we just act on that word. And as we do, we find out what, what is good versus what is evil. And the tree of the knowledge of? Everywhere you go, you see good and wonderful. Now you need God's eyeglasses. So you block out the evil and only pray for things that need to change. Can you say amen? I hope you got that. That's good. Now, let's move on to this. You got to understand, okay? Now, in this, this area of prayer and intercession, let's, let's get into this a little deeper, okay? All right? So we present our body a living sacrifice. We then walk the word out. We find out what is good, what is acceptable. How many remember those days where you tried God out a little bit, what you could get away with and what you couldn't? Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You were coming in on camera. Yeah, remember those days you thought nobody was looking and you were doing all that? Come on. God, God didn't wink, but he kind of laughs at that kind of stuff. Because you're his child. How many times have you been in the cookie jar? Mama found you. So instead of playing all the head games, let's find out what God really wants for us to do. Let's do it and be blessed by doing it. Let's be overwhelmed and share Christ with everybody and stop looking at everybody's, you know, flaws and stuff. My goodness, I have so many flaws. It's amazing that you don't wear sunglasses when you look at me. I told you that when I first, I'm, I'm a restored minister. You want to dig up my past? That's fine if you want to play with Fluffy. But frankly, I'm living from this day on and my best that I can with God's, all God's help. And I don't see your faults. You have plenty, but I don't see him because Jesus teaches us to look to the heart and to encourage our growth and our love and friendship for one another. Say amen. All right, so we know now that we have to lay our body down. Say amen. All right, the next thing I want to tell you is, look, go with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Oh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. You and I can come boldly before the throne of God. Say amen. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So you and I as children of God, we say Father in Jesus' name, right? What happens? The armor comes down right over you. Not only that, but the Holy Spirit, listen, puts you instantly into Christ, and Christ carries you up before the Father. So when you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, it goes boop, 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 shh, you're right before the Father. Now, think of something intelligence would say. Exactly. That's how, that's how much God the Father loves you. He's got a special elevator. Go right here, right up. So you come boldly right before the throne of grace. The reason why I love to teach this way, because I see in pictures, folks. When God gives me his word, I see a picture of it all happening. I'm an imaginational, visionary type fellow. So when God gives me his word, I see it all in the pictures. Yeah. I see it in pictures. And, and the way I can convey it the best to you is convey it in pictures. Because that's what our language is for. Even the Jewish language, the Hebrew language, all in pictures. You, so you see Bethel, the word Bethel, it looks like a house of our church. Their alphabet looks like a little church sitting there. Bethel. El means God. House of El. House of God. But see, our language is the same too. We hear the word and then we put a definition on the word we heard. 
Now, how many know we can have some pretty crazy definitions? But we put God's definition on it. All right. Say, I'm with you. So say, as a child of God, I go to the dressing room. All right. <coughs> I've been, I speak real loud when I get anointed. So once the armor is on us, we walk around with him. Amen? You see, when I came over to the church, I'm fully covered. First thing I get this morning, I, <coughs> excuse me, first thing I, I get this morning is a little text reminding me of 20 years ago when I blew it. Did you know I made a mistake 20 years ago? You know it? So did you. You see how stupid that is? What did they do? In Jesus' time, the religious people of the day found a woman caught in adultery. Remember the story? How did they find her in the very act? Somebody had to be peeping. Somebody had to have been setting it up. Somebody had to get the woman in the very act and bring it before all the council, which were all men. And they're all holding rocks. Okay? And <clears throat> so they brought her before Jesus. And what did Jesus say? Here's a real deep one. You without sin, you toss the rock. Everybody dropped it. Why do we think, now that we have a little teaching under our belt, we can run around and be Mr. Corrector. We'll correct you of this, we'll correct you of that. That's why the church of Jesus Christ has no power. Because we're shorting it out on everybody. Instead of focusing on the devil and meeting with God. Say amen! That's good stuff, folks. Don't be a meddler, be a minister. All right. Okay, Ephesians chapter uh, 6 we're going to look at the armor of God. Woo, I got a little time yet. All right. Okay, we're going to start at verse 10. Pe <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. I mowed my lawn and did a bunch of grass fed stuff. And I'm not claiming any allergies. Okay, so. All right, this point. Being dressed by God Face to face. Here's some of the pieces we get. Ephesians 6, look at verse 10. What's the first word? Finally, Paul is saying, look, I've taught you all of this stuff. Now let's get down to the nitty gritty. Finally, brethren, be strong where? Every time you see the word in, okay, very powerful word. We're in the church. We're not out in the parking lot. You're in Christ, not out of Christ. You're not religious. You walk with Almighty God. There's the difference. It's not a prideful thing. In fact, let me tell you about pride. The reason why God doesn't want us to brag, because when you brag about how good you're doing for God, now you've got to live up to it all the rest of your days. You're bragging and you're sort of adding to things. And now, you've got to live up to that the rest of your days. How about you just don't brag unless it be on God? Don't tell everybody how good you are and what you know. She's really intimidating. Hey, I want to let you know I know everything, so I want to tell you something. <laughs> Moving right along. I'm messing with you. All right. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Father, in Jesus' name, meet with God. Put it on that way. Okay? That you may be able to stand against what? So there's something about this armor that keeps Satan from lying to you. There's something about wearing this armor that completely puts you in the spirit realm and untouchable from the devil. So we need to know about it. We need to understand how it functions and how it works. Can you say amen? So finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Here are those words again. But against principalities, fallen archangels, against powers, those that listen to them, against rulers of the darkness of this age, those who practice Luciferian, occultic, witchcraft doctrine. See, he lists them right here. And there's one more. Do you see it? Okay. Now this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Those are your little demons. Do you know what a little demon is? A little demon is a disembodied spirit that looks for somebody who will listen to him so he can get some expression in the earth. Fallen angels, they don't need to get somebody. They can manifest right on the spot. They ate with, with Abraham. You see... So angels don't need to look for a body. They didn't lose a body. But these little demons were the antediluvian people, were the, the Nephilim giants that all got wiped out. Their spirits had to go somewhere. Can't go to heaven because they're unredeemable. Can't go to hell because hell's not prepared for them yet. It's not their time. So they roved the earth seeking whom they may lie to. Thank God you and I pray and seek God. We don't even have time to listen to that junk. Say amen. Are you with me? So, we wrestle against, so it says against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the what? The whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Every day is as evil as the next, or is as good as the next, depending on who you're focusing on. Oh, me. So catch it. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be withstanding in the evil day, having done all to stand. Why does he talk about stand? Well, who are we in? Jesus. Who we, so when we stand up, who's around us? Jesus. So what God is actually saying is, if you get all this, all you need to do is meet with me and stand up in me, and the me are going to wipe the devil out. So, we go in, meet with God, God dresses us before the throne. Try to behave yourself over there, young man. All right. <laughs> anyway, so, he dresses us, clothes us, he puts a robe of righteousness on us. Who's that? Jesus. The only thing that makes you righteous because you carry Jesus from. And his robes are robes of righteousness. Then on top of the robes comes the armor. The armor is light. God is light and in him is how much darkness? So when you got the armor of light on, where's darkness going? Everywhere but you. You're running from you. Of course, you have to be aware of that. Because if you're not, then Satan will call you out. Remember, once you start getting this down, you are dangerous. You're dangerous. You can rip Satan's kingdom one side or the other. Why do you suppose, after all that prayer going on those abortion things, it's now happening? Because people are focusing their prayer. They're not shotgunning it. I send out things for I want you to pray for specifically to hit it with a sniper bullet. So when I do that, you better get in contact with me. If I can't get in touch with you, how am I going to give you things that God tells me for you to begin to intercede for? Hello? Consult that news feed that I send out. Every day I'm sending out stuff on it. It's going to be your complete communication other than God for a little bit of while till we get everything set up. Can you say amen? All right, I'm done excited. All right, so look at this. We know that we have armor, but it's spiritual armor, so a physical person cannot put on spiritual armor. God has to put it on you. The armor is Christ. He is light, and he does the fighting. Once the armor's on, it works with us to settle us down and to stand humble in him while Jesus rips the devil apart. All you need to do is say, Father, the enemy is messing with me. He has no right. I release you. They go and deal with him in Jesus' name. Do what you do best, God, in Jesus' name. 
Now you've given God permission to re recompense the foolish man trying to attack you, the devil. Recompense his mind, saith the Lord, and let me repay him. So what happens? We get all caught up. We're yelling at the devil. And we're rebuking and we're doing all that. That's just a game. The Bible says, bring no railing accusation against anybody. Don't mock anybody. Don't make fun out of anybody. Because when you do, you open up the devil and the enemy comes in and attacks you. But rather, project Jesus and let him fight. You relax. Say, Lord, there's nothing I can do. I'm pretty upset right now. So I'm withdrawing in you. I'm letting you handle this. In Jesus' name. Do you hear I said that? I have to do that probably twice, three times a week sometimes. I'm a pastor. But God is so good. All right, let's go on. So what we don't know is what I'm going to tell you how to use this equipment. All right, so let's look at it. So having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. Who's our armor? Who is the truth? So what you do when you begin your walk with God up until the time you go on to be with God, you continue every day, just wrap Jesus around your loins. Loins is our private parts, our, our, our most vulnerable parts. Jesus says, wrap me around your most... So when we go to the Father in Jesus' name, he wraps Jesus around and belts this armor on us. The reason why we have descriptions of the armor like this is not for us to dress ourselves this way. It's for us to understand this is Jesus and these are the parts he protects and controls when you're in the spirit. When you're in the spirit, walking in the spirit, you have this armor on. This armor controls your ability to stand and destroys any darkness out in front of you. Say amen. So listen, stand having your waist girded with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, where which you shall be <coughs> able to quench, excuse me again guys, quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all kinds of prayer, and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. See, all this armor is all about prayer. Well, what do you mean? You see, once you start praying for others to be set free, you start praying for your country to live for God, you start praying for your family to come to the Lord. Lord, I don't know all my relatives, but Lord, those are lost. I claim that they get salvation. Once you start doing that, you're dislodging strongholds from the enemy. Don't you know that? You're, he thinks he's safe by possessing or harassing somebody, and you just popped him off of him. You see, what the Bible says when you see a brother sinning a sin, you who pray, you can change that brother's option and his choices, and you have saved a brother from sin and from fiery hell. So it says you have a lot of power as an intercessor to turn people around in the spirit if you learn to use the equipment properly. So everyone say, I want to learn how to use it properly. So every time when you pray prayer, you Father in Jesus' name. Why? Because God commands in that day, you don't ask Jesus anything. You ask the Father in Jesus' name. Now see, in the Old Testament, Jesus was with them, so they just talked to him like day and night. Now he's gone on. He says, address the Father. He's the one that is doing all this good stuff. Would you talk to your Father and, and tell him about me? So we lift Jesus up. We say, Father, in Jesus' name. And when we do, we're right before the throne, and God completely dresses us. Now, what does he dress us in? Well, he dresses us in a belt that holds everything together. Truth. He puts on a breastplate of righteousness. Okay? Who's, who's the breastplate? Jesus. And so he protects your heart and your gut and all the inner parts of you. Amen. And helmet of, I'm just going to go through. Helmet of salvation. 
protects your mind. When you're ministering, when that helmet is on, your mind doesn't wander. I'm going to say it again. It's just a distraction. Okay? When, when you got the helmet on, your mind doesn't wander. It keeps your mind from wandering. You're focused. But, but when you're just, you know, doing your own thing and everything, which is okay, then your mind is free to just think and all like But when you're really ministering to something that is really ugly, like I busted up witches' covens. I work with the police department in Enumclaw. We busted up satanic covens where they were killing children. You can read about that in the paper. You can see my face there. I've been used all over for these kinds of things. Why would God use somebody like you, Pastor Kerry? Because he taught me a long time ago how to wear him. How to walk around in him. How to be with him. He's become my friend. Can I tell you about my friend? Would you like to really love and know him? And what he really does? And that's what we're having here. We're having a family discussion. And those of you watching in, I even have critics watch in. It's so fun. I love it. Okay, let's finish up with you. So while this armor is on you, hopefully all day, you don't have to worry about your mind thinking anything because your mind's focused. You've got a helmet that protects you from the lies of the enemy, but it keeps everything focused. You've got a breastplate that nothing can get through to hurt your heart or anything in this. You've got a belt of truth on. Somebody tries to lie to you, the armor will tell you, lie, lie, lie. They're trying to in a straight face, trying to tell you something, and you hear, lie, lie. <laughs> And you're going, oh boy, don't show any facial reactions, you know. And so this equipment is Jesus Christ. So your head's not going to go bonkers. It's going to be focused. So you want that armor on. Now, Pastor Kerry, what about the, the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith? Those are your action pieces. You raise the shield. When you so, know somebody hates you, and they, you could tell they're talking about you. It's something that's just not right. Lift up the shield of faith and say, Lord, no weapon formed against me will prosper. And it's set it down. All you're doing is actions of faith. The whole time you're fighting, you have not left Jesus' silhouette over you. You have not left the armor. You're sitting. You can be sitting. You could be standing. You're making a stand and Jesus is doing the fighting. This is why people who get involved in a lot of what we call spiritual warfare and everything, which I did, they get way out into Satan's realm. The biggest spiritual warfare, welfare, warfare, the biggest warfare fighting that I do is, Father, get them. Lord, they're picking on me. They're picking on your people. Father, I bind that up. Get them. Saying that, he being the perfect judge, he's going to give to them what they've been sowing, but nothing unfair. Do you know what judgment is? Write this down. Judgment is everything that's sown is reaped at one time. So if you did a whole bunch of nasty things, thank God for forgiveness, but maybe not last week when you never asked God to do anything, and in God decides to lift his hand, everything you did, you sowed, you'll start reaping. So we wear God's armor around and we don't be concerned about that. I had a witch one day, he says, you know, I'm going to cast a spell on you and I'm going to make you just crawl and crawl. And I looked at him and says, you know what? I got more power in my little finger than you do in your mouth. And you know what? That man got saved that, that, that evening. And everybody and he praying, crying out to God because Satan had him so bare, if he didn't do what he, Satan wanted him to do, he was going to kill him. So everything's done with Satan in fear. And he's, oh, dear. And he, it was, he had an upbringing with Christianity. And he got saved, thank God. I'm going to meet him in heaven. Oh, well, he was dressed for the occasion. He had a fur coat on, a long thing like Moses, and a big beard, and he had all the markings of a, you know, a witch type. They, they're not called warlocks, they're just called witches. Boobs, you know. And he was standing there, and when I walked up to him and got right into his face, I walked right up and says, God told me. He said, God brought me down here. And it was just a 
meeting from heaven. Don't you let the enemy intimidate you. You're wearing God around. Don't let the enemy intimidate you. You're full of God. Why do we do that? Because of unrenewed mind. All right, finish. So, what have we covered? We need the sword of the Spirit. What is the sword of the Spirit? Tell me. The Word of God is the sword of? Okay, Spirit. Small s or capital S? Capital S. The Word should be wielded by the Holy Spirit in you to speak it. When I preach in the morning, let me ask you something. When I share in the anointings on me, you can sense something, can't you? That's the anointing. That isn't me. That's the anointing coming out of that. That's what you want to look for everywhere you go. You want to make sure whoever's talking to you about God, some anointing is bearing witness with you. So they're just not filling you full, you know? Okay, and so that's what I look for. And I, that's what I crave for. I want to know God. I want God, and when I share, I want, I want it to be powerful to you. And I want it to paint pictures to you. So Satan doesn't like that. Let's be religious. I'll give you three steps on how to be good. And then we'll pray. You see what I mean? Can you see it now? How the enemy has worked so hard to dumb down the church. Make us passive and fight amongst ourselves. I'm anointed to correct you. No, you're not. I'm going to turn you over my knee and I'll slap you. That's the kind of person I am. And then I'll ask God, forgive, forgive me. <laughs> Scott's the same way. <clears throat> we'll just beat him into it. No. All right. Can you laugh a little bit with me? All right, good. You know I'm not that part. All right, so. All right, let's go through a couple of things. So, our waist is girded with who? Jesus. We have the breastplate of righteousness. Who's righteous? Jesus. Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Are you ready at any time just to share about your faith? You don't have to know the word. Just tell people what God has been doing with you. Wow, I've been learning new things. And he's taking care of that. He's answered this prayer. You see, that's all you need to do. That's your testimony. Then when you get to know the word a little better, you can share. Okay, say amen. But don't think the enemies, I can't share anything. I really don't know anything. Well, let's, you know, that's, you know where that comes from. <laughs> Moving right along. The breastplate of righteousness, which is Christ. Our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, which is Christ. Hello? Our helmet of salvation guards our thinking. Christ. Can you say amen? All right. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Folks, when you pray and when you speak the word, don't speak from here. Everyone, touch your head. Speak from your gut. The spirit of God is in your core. Bring God out when you talk. Can I show you an illustration? You ready to receive some? I'm, I'm going to say Jesus right off the top of my head. And then I'm going to speak Jesus out of my spirit. And I want you to just open up. So close your eyes. Okay, you receive from Jesus, not from me. Now see, Jesus loves you, Sherry. Now listen, Jesus loves you. What's the difference? One came out of my core, out of my heart, with power, and the other one came off the top of my head with intellect. All right, everybody, stand ready. I'm going to pray for you. Did you get that? You see, who, would, who came up with the dumb idea of it's an unspoken prayer? I've been praying. No, you've been thinking. Now, let me just tell you so you can laugh. God can hear your prayers in your mind, but he needs you to speak them so he can answer them. You didn't get Jesus in your heart by thinking him in. You said, Jesus... I surrender. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. And he came right on in. How do you send out Jesus and destroy the kingdoms of darkness? 
I'm going to break up the witch's covenant the same way. You bring God out of your spirit in words and you chop him with the sword of the spirit. No weapon formed against you will prosper, but whatever you do will prosper. Your tongue will be filled with sweetness and goodness. Whatever you begin to think about, whatever you begin to be stepped, God will order your steps. See, this is how I pray for you. Thinking that your words are giving God permission, which they are, not that you give God permission, but that God needs invitation. You see, have you ever had somebody say, say, well, man, I got my answer to prayer and everything, and somebody turn around and say, it's because I prayed for you. No, don't get that one. No, no. It's because you ask God on behalf of them. Okay. Don't run around and say, it's because I prayed for you. That's a brag, and you probably don't know it. No, it's because I ask God on your behalf because he loves you. Better answer, power answer. So, let's talk about the armor. So we go in, we meet with God, he puts the armor on us. He cleanses us. He fills us. He charges us. Then he zaps our flesh, gets it all pressed and everything, puts it on us with the anointing in it, and then sends us out in our day. It says, Jimmy, watch out for cars when you go out in the street. Is that what he says to us? Be careful, Carrie, when you go out there. Because yet, no. He says, go out there and smash the enemy. I'm with you. Go out there and love people into my kingdom. Go out there and tell them the truth. All they hear is lies daily. And we shall go out with joy and shall break forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before them. We go out with joy and we sing with joy. Amen. You read some of those Old Testament words as the Israelites are marching into Jericho and they're outnumbered 50,000 to one and they're marching with joy and everything because they know they have a big God. Why was David so powerful when all the Israelites were stuck in holes while Goliath was cursing at them? Why was David so powerful? Because he relied on his God, not his on his slingshot. Why are you so powerful? Because you rely on your God, not your own intellect. Well, if you got something out of that this morning, this is just the first key. Now we'll be talking about ways to pray. So let's give the Lord praise, will you? Any questions? <laughs>